Bonjour. Okay, trigger warning for this video. I will discuss captivity, abuse, addiction, and human as well as animal self-injury. Judith Herman writes in Trauma and Recovery, most people have no knowledge or understanding of the psychological changes of captivity. Social judgment of chronically traumatized people therefore tends to be extremely harsh. She enjoins us to learn from survivors who understand more profoundly than any investigator the effects of captivity. She writes, When the victim has been reduced to a goal of simple survival, psychological constriction becomes an essential form of adaptation. This narrowing applies to every aspect of life to relationships, activities, thoughts, memories, emotions, and even sensations. And while this constriction is adaptive in captivity, it also leads to a kind of atrophy in the psychological capacities that have been suppressed and to the overdevelopment of a solitary inner life. People in captivity become adept practitioners of the arts of altered consciousness. Through the practice of dissociation, voluntary thought suppression, minimization, and sometimes outright denial, they learn to alter an unbearable reality. This constriction in the capacities for active engagement in the world, which is common even after a single trauma, becomes most pronounced in chronically traumatized people who are often described as passive and helpless. In another section, she writes, she has learned that every action will be watched that most actions will be thwarted, and that she will pay dearly for failure to the extent that the perpetrator has succeeded in enforcing his demand for total submission. She will perceive any exercise of her own initiative as insubordination. Before undertaking any action, she will scan the environment expecting retaliation. Prolonged captivity undermines or destroys the ordinary sense of a relatively safe sphere of initiative in which there is some tolerance for trial and error. To the chronically traumatized person, any action has potentially dire consequences. There is no room for mistakes. Rosenkopf describes his constant expectation of punishment. Quote, I'm in a perpetual cringe. I'm constantly stopping to let whoever is behind me pass, unquote. Prolonged captivity disrupts all human relationships and amplifies the dialectic of trauma. The survivor oscillates between intense attachment and terrified withdrawal. She approaches all relationships as though questions of life and death are at stake. She may cling desperately to a person whom she perceives as a rescuer, flee suddenly from a person she suspects to be a perpetrator or accomplice, show great loyalty and devotion to a person she perceives as an ally, and heap wrath and scorn on a person who appears to be a complacent bystander. The roles she assigns to others may change suddenly as the result of small lapses or disappointments, for no internal representation of another person is any longer secure. Once again, there is no room for mistakes. Over time, as most people fail the survivor's exacting tests of trustworthiness, she tends to withdraw from relationships. The isolation of the survivor thus persists even after she is free. Prolonged captivity also produces profound alterations in the victim's identity. All the psychological structures of the self, the image of the body, the internalized images of others, and the values and ideals that lend a person a sense of coherence and purpose have been invaded and systematically broken down. During captivity, the victim cannot express her humiliated rage at the perpetrator, for to do so would jeopardize her survival. Even after a release, the former prisoner may continue to fear retribution and may be slow to express rage against her captor. Moreover, she is left with a burden of unexpressed rage against all those who remained indifferent to her fate and who failed to help her. Occasional outbursts of rage may further alienate the survivor from others and prevent the restoration of relationships. 
In an effort to control her rage, the survivor may withdraw even further from people, thus perpetuating her isolation. The survivor may direct her rage and hatred against herself. Former prisoners carry their captors' hatred with them even after release, and sometimes they continue to carry out their captors' destructive purposes with their own hands. I'll quote once again from Johan Hari's TED Talk, Everything You Think You Know About Addiction Is Wrong. What if addiction is about your cage? What if addiction is an adaptation to your environment? And now from to uh, sum up from some of my other reading about animals in captivity. Zoo or laboratory rearing and isolation are important factors leading to increased susceptibility to self-harm in higher mammals, e.g. macaque monkeys. Captive birds are sometimes known to engage in feather plucking, causing damage to feathers that can range from feather shredding to the removal of most or all feathers within the bird's reach, or even the mutilation of skin or muscle tissue. And now quoting from another article, the single most common denominator among animals whose self-harm is isolation, social isolation. Primates bite themselves, parrots pull out their feathers, and dogs and cats lick themselves. Such self-injurious behavior tends to occur in emotionally disturbing situations, particularly those over which the individual has little to no control, like being locked up alone. Research on captive primates and birds has identified that self-injurious behavior is a coping strategy to reduce arousal. Biting, licking, and feather plucking lower heart rate, one marker of relaxation. Presumably the same sort of thing happens on a physiological level for people who injure themselves. People report feeling more calm during the act and for a little while after. Janice Whitlock, director of the Cornell Research Program, has this to say about human self-injury. Self-injury is generally understood to be a maladaptive coping mechanism. People who self-injure tend to either feel very intense, overwhelming negative emotions, or to feel emotionally numb or dissociated, which can be very frightening. So self-injury is used to release unbearable, unwanted feelings. And for others who feel dead inside, it helps them to feel alive. Relief can last for minutes, hours, and sometimes longer. For those it works for, self-injury is easy, accessible, very effective, and very fast. It's very appealing to have that degree of control and certainty. Numerous studies show that people who self-injure feel their emotions much more powerfully in their body, like a physical experience that is so overwhelming that it needs to stop. Now I'm going to speak about my experiences. In 2011, I held two part-time jobs. At both jobs, I worked isolated alone with erratic, over-medicated, and over-controlling female bosses who recreated childhood abuse situations. I had four roommates, tearing my house and belongings to shreds and passive-aggressively fighting with one another and expecting me to fix it. My friends were abusive and attempts to socialize and unwind only added to my stress. Every morning in the shower and every lunch break, and increasingly during bathroom breaks, I would cut myself. When that wasn't enough to deal with my catastrophe curve life, I added in cocaine. I wound up totaling two cars within a year, which I've never done before or since. I went through a nervous breakdown, which I talked about in my video on writing on hypergraphia. For me, employment, education, and communities can feel like captivity and control. These situations can feel easily triggering of my PTSD symptoms, overpowering, exploitive, brainwashing, and controlling every aspect of how I look and act and talk and dress, where and when I eat and go to the bathroom and sleep and rest, and where I am to be and what I'm to be doing and not doing, and who with for the overwhelming bulk of my life. Even living with other people can trigger those flashbacks, memories, those feelings of captivity, monitoring, judgment, increasing demands and control, as well as lack of power to limit when and how much others can invade my space, time, and intention. And here's some other things that touch off that 
sense of captivity for me. Having my car blocked in, being trapped in a car with someone that I'm giving a ride to or getting a ride from, because if they start talking to me and they set me off, there's nothing I can do about that that's not going to have profound consequences for me later. Being too inebriated at a party to leave, which is the time the most bad things happen to me, hence I no longer go to parties. Being physically barred from leaving somewhere by a person. Being restrained physically and being hugged, which releases stress hormones for me and not oxytocin as well as triggering memories of assault. There are a lot of people who are touch averse for whom hugging is a stressful thing and not a comforting thing. I'm not alone in this. We just weren't included in these scientific studies that say hugging is good for you because like who of us who doesn't like to be touched would even want to participate in such a study. So if experiencing closeness and showing affection is your goal, then in hugging me, you will have monumentally failed. If, however, you're only out to please yourself, then you can just stay away from me. I also have problems with authority. Having had too many people of real control or assumed social power over me, abusing that and being accountable to no one, as well as allegedly accountable, responsible people in power and justice systems being completely uncaring and ineffective. Right now, living homeless in a broken down RV I don't own with no better options and plenty of worse ones, I feel pretty captive and powerless. I'm living day by day as well as I can. I've done everything I can, tried everything I can, and I have been stuck here almost three years. And this is still the best of bad options. To live homeless here or anywhere else is to live with ongoing trauma, to live at or over my psychological tolerance. I'm always at the edge of breaking down or breaking down or trying to put the pieces back together while simultaneously they're falling apart. What would be speed bumps for the more economically privileged or those with stable living conditions become crippling brick walls for my life? I'm lucky that in North Carolina, I have access to free mental health care. But in therapy, I can't even begin to address the bigger issues of multiple traumas throughout my life, my upbringing, grief, and the assaults I've survived when my entire focus is dealing with day-to-day -day survival. I don't even remember a time in my life when it wasn't that. And survival is an increasingly difficult thing for me. Sometimes most of my sessions are spent dealing with SSDI crap or food and nutrition services crap or whatever the latest overwhelming survival stressor has hit me. How triggered and panicky I get every time I get anything official looking by mail, thinking my basic needs will be taken away. Living with that threat of losing basic needs is traumatizing in ways people who aren't living this way tend to trivialize to me and counsel patience. You don't know what it's like to live this way for three years. Your privilege is showing. Tuck it in. I also strongly object to privileged people appointing themselves at the objective expert on what homelessness, trauma, poverty, or disability looks like. Nobody's objective. We have these terrible sensationalized pictures of everything, homelessness, trauma, poverty, abuse, rape, cults, that cause us to deny other people's realities unless they're sufficiently to the extreme we've seen in the media. It also makes us unable to recognize and respond appropriately to those things when they're happening to us or to our friends, our loved ones. It's easy to judge. It's easy to look at someone's behaviors, at their moods, and call them unreasonable, and even treat that person as someone who cannot be trusted with self-determination, with paternalistic and heavy-handed advice and non-consensual surprise interference to try to save them for their own good. Living as I do, there's a huge difficulty in relating to other people because everyone I meet and try to make a connection with doesn't live like I do. 
hasn't had this lifetime, these experiences, this current form of captivity and disability, and I haven't had their experiences. Too often people prove unable to set aside preconceptions and judgments that are well socialized into all of us and into me too about who I am and what I do and what I've been through and what I am worth. They're even unable to realize that these preconceptions are sitting there with us like an invisible third person. I'm alienated not just by my unusual and nearly unique set of formative experiences, but by my current circumstances, which I see largely as a result of the aftermath of that upbringing. I usually don't have the energy to both deal with my day-to-day -day life and make the effort for both of us to bridge the gap between us. My point with this video is to say that, first of all, captivity sucks. It sucks. Captivity sucks. And secondly, it completely scrambles our higher functioning and depletes us enormously in every conceivable way. I think I'm not the only one who feels trapped and captive given the rates of addiction, self-harm, and other self-destructive behaviors that external ob observers who don't live with the results find incomprehensible or sometimes use as an adequate reason to make decisions for us to compromise our self-determination, to take away even more control, agency, and privacy for those of us who may feel we have too little already. I do wonder if being human and alive today with money and culture and social structures means all we get is a choice of cages. I wonder if I'll ever feel safe or free to live a life where I think past tomorrow. I wonder if I'll ever be able to experience close friendship or intimacy with another person without feeling triggered, trapped, threatened somewhere down the line wondering if every moment is ticking down to some unknown expiration date when some line will be crossed, some words will be said, something will happen once too often and the burden of that relationship outweighs the relief. We understand when we adopt a dog from a shelter that displays certain behaviors that the dog has experienced abuse in its past. Some people can't handle those complex emotional needs, and others can and do make allowances for what the dog needs. I wish we were more understanding of abused people. Maybe it has to do with the shame and fear of knowing that we do it to each other, that even people who seem nice and normal behind closed doors do things to other humans that scare the ever-living hell out of us. Maybe it scares us knowing on some level that, driven to extremes, all humans are capable of hurting one another, and knowing that we often can't tell if someone has been driven to extremes by life, by their cage, their trauma. There's not one monolithic experience or story of captivity, of self-harm, of addiction. What I want to say here in this video is, let people tell their stories as much or as little as they want in their ways. Sometimes these behaviors are already telling the first part of the story, beginning with, ouch. I heard somewhere that listening is loving, and somewhere else that listening is justice. Thank you for listening.